Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Paul Matsko, filling in for Trevor Burris. I am host of Libertarianism.org's newest podcast, Building Tomorrow. Joining us today is Matthew Feeney. He is director of the Cato Institute's new project on emerging technology. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Matthew. Thank you for having me. What is the project on emerging technology? Yeah, the project on emerging technologies is Cato's uh, relatively new uh, new endeavor. So it's uh, I'm trying to count now. Uh, I think it began a couple months ago, June or July. I should probably know that, but it's a uh, relatively new. Uh, I'm running it. It's a project of one at the moment, but the the goal of the project is to uh, highlight the difficult policy areas that are raised by what we're calling emerging technologies. Now, this is always a, a difficult thing to define, right? And of course, uh, emerging tech is not just changing technologies, but new things arriving on the scene. And what I've done is to try and highlight a couple of issues where I think Cato has uh, a unique capability to highlight interesting libertarian policies associated with new tech. So uh, some of the policy areas that we're focusing on include things like artificial intelligence, driverless cars, drones, uh, data and privacy issues, uh, and others. Um, there are a lot of tech issues that have been around for a while, so uh, I don't think net neutrality is going anywhere anytime soon, uh, nor are the numerous antitrust issues associated with big tech companies. Uh, and we've certainly at Cato had people write about those issues before, but this new project is uh, confining itself to uh, five specific areas, but I'm sure that as the project grows and develops, the, the list of issues we'll be tackling will grow. How did you choose those five in particular? Yeah, so the the five were areas where I thought uh, Cato didn't have enough people writing about, uh, and uh, also areas where I think libertarians have something new and interesting to contribute. So, for example, uh, I've uh, first couple of years at Cato, I did write about uh, the sharing economy. Uh, I also wrote a little bit about drones, body cameras, uh, new tech issues. But my work with drones, for example, was just on law enforcement use of drones, uh, specifically the concerns associated with uh, drone surveillance. But I wasn't writing uh, at all really on the commercial use of drones. So the exciting world of uh, taco delivery drones and building inspection drones. Uh, and that's a whole different policy area really uh, compared to drone surveillance. So that was an area where I thought we should really have someone uh, who can direct a project that will commission work on those kind of uh, those kind of issues? Uh, another one would be so artificial intelligence, right, is uh, something that I think is very exciting, but poses difficult questions to libertarians. And uh, libertarian commentary on that space has been uh, not nearly, I think, as robust and as loud as it could be. So that's another reason why I picked uh, that. But yeah, basically, the the five I think fulfill a criteria of. Uh, being focused on new and emerging tech, uh, that libertarians have something interesting to say about, and that Cato's in a good position to uh, to tackle. Can you give us an example of what you mean by libertarians have something new and interesting to talk about? Because a lot of a lot of tech policy in the past has taken the form of its regulatory policy, mm -hmm. and it's should this thing be regulated or not, mm -hmm. typically, and then what form should it be regulated in? Um, and and that tends to break down along the standard lines. You have the people who are opposed to regulation. You have people who are generally pro-regulation. But what's what's uniquely, I guess, libertarian in in the way that you're approaching technology issues? Yeah. So I don't think that the way that we're approaching uh, the project is much different to how a lot of us here in the building approach our other policy areas. And for me, it's to tackle the issues raised by this tech by embracing a presumption of freedom and trying to minimize coercion, right? So that's uh, so number one on the presumption of freedom that we should we should act in a way that allows for innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, make sure that people working in this space are in a position where they're asking for forgiveness more often than they're asking for permission. Uh, and as far as minimizing coercion, this goes back to some of the 
work I discussed earlier when we're talking about data privacy and drones, uh, we should be wary of some of the government use of the technology uh, and making sure that exciting new technologies like drones can be used for really cool stuff like deliveries and uh, other private applications while also trying to make sure that the scary aspects of it like surveillance are being uh, are being uh, put under lock and key as much as possible. Uh, something like artificial intelligence might be another good example that we want to make sure that people working in the space uh, are free to innovate and to uh, explore new ideas, but we want to make sure the government use of it, especially when it comes to autonomous weapons uh, and autom um, automated surveillance, that uh, we ensure that there are privacies and keep those threats checked. So emerging tech by its nature is still, you know, yet to come. It's already not yet. It's kind of here, but it's still in prototype or developmental form. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the potential benefits as well as potential risks are still in the future. So like as you're trying to decide what should be regulated and what shouldn't be regulated or in what ways it should or should not be regulated, like what what's your rule of thumb for trying to rule on decide on something that hasn't actually happened yet? Yeah, I suppose the libertarian response to this is uh, comparatively straightforward, right? That we should uh, proceed with caution when dealing with uh, imaginary threats. So let's think of a good example, right? Uh, maybe only because I work on it in my own research, right? But I think it's fair to say that in the coming decades that we will see more and more government use of uh, unmanned aerial surveillance tools. I think that's a fair assumption. Uh, I also think it's fair to say that that technology will improve uh, as much as it proliferates. And as I did, right, I wrote a, a paper saying, look, uh, we should, in preparation for this world, we should have the following, uh, we should have the following policies in place. Uh, what I'm very hesitant to do, and not that it should never be done, right, but we should be hesitant, I think, to develop new rules because of a new thing coming onto the block. Uh, drones, for example, raise interesting privacy concerns, but it's not clear that they're necessarily unique uh, in the way that uh, a lot of people think they are. So we don't like the fact that drones could be used by people to snoop on our, us in our bedrooms or to fly over our barbecues, and we don't like that police could use them to uh, to do surveillance. But we already have laws, peeping Tom laws. We have uh, a tort system that can deal with a lot of these complaints. And while the Supreme Court precedent on things like drone surveillance is not particularly uh, not very satisfying, it is the case that states can and have gone above and beyond what the Supreme Court requires. So going forward, I think we should be hesitant to think of, well, we need a driverless car policy. We're going to write down, oh, we need a drone policy. We should think about the kind of threats that uh, come from these these fields, but uh, resist the temptation to write a lot of uh, regulation in anticipation for the proliferation of this technology. But isn't that the problem that because these are emerging technologies, they're, they're not technologies that we either as citizens or just ordinary people in our lives or as lawmakers or legislators, regulators, there we don't have any experience with them. We haven't used them. Um, we haven't seen like how they shake out. And so that that notion of saying, well, you know, we should we shouldn't just imagine threats. Isn't that what we're kind of forced to do? One of the things that can just that distinguishes emerging technologies now from emerging technologies in the past is the pace at which they can become all pervasive, the pace at which they can spread. So either they're network technologies that just, you know, in a matter of years, suddenly everyone is on Facebook, um, whereas, you know, the printing press took a lot longer to get books into everyone's hands, that don't we have to be anticipating threats? Because it, with a lot of this stuff, if we don't and we don't protect ourselves now, it might be too late. Well, too late for what, right? This is the, the question. Um... I think history has enough examples of people uh, exaggerating threats uh, that we can learn from. So uh, one of my favorite examples of this, right, is the uh, the British 1865 Locomotive Act, which required uh, 
a vehicle that not pulled by an animal, uh, so a, a steam-powered locomotive, uh, if it was on a road and towing something, it was legally required that you would have a man 60, 60 yards ahead of it with a red flag, right? Because people were anticipating certain threats, right? That these these new uh, technologies are going to cause accidents. And so what we need is, it's obvious, right? We need a man running ahead of these things with a red flag to to alert people that this very dangerous thing is coming across. Uh, I don't know if that's the right kind of approach to dealing with emerging technology issues, right? We We can anticipate that with the emergence of the locomotive that there will be occasional accidents and some people will get hurt. Uh, the the early years of flight, for example, are just full of people killing themselves in these new flying machines. Uh, and uh, you might, it sounds a little cold hearted to say, but the price of innovation for something like that is that p mistakes get made and people might get hurt. Uh, and, and that's difficult, especially in today's world where news travels so quickly that the moment that someone gets hit by a driverless car or uh, a drone lands on someone's head, everyone's going to hear about it. And uh, I think people are thirsty for news, for, for bad news, uh, unfortunately. And uh, that's something we're always going to be fighting against. So I, I actually would go on record right now saying I'm in favor of a law requiring that Elon Musk wave a red flag 60 feet in front of every driverless vehicle. I guess he has more time on his hands these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, so I, I hear you talking about essentially assumption of risk that yeah. with when it comes to tech, we have a long history of people overrating or exaggerating fears of the downsides of a tech mm -hmm. and having a harder time imagining the beneficial applications. And so a light touch regulatory policy wedded with like a general cultural sense of, hey, if you want to experiment with this, uh, as long as you limit the externalities, the, the damage to other people, mm -hmm. go for it. I mean, is that kind of the attitude you bring to stuff like on the, on, you know, unmanned vehicles and the like? Yeah, I think that the, the barrier for government intervention in this space should be uh, difficult to overcome, right? So it has a very high risk of death or serious injury is basically where I would say you can maybe argue for some kind of regulation. And again, we're, we're sitting in the Cato Institute, right? I mean, our, our approach to regulation, uh, this is a unique approach to emerging technology. I think libertarians across the board have light touch approach. And I feel like you can have that approach while accepting that there are risks, right? Uh, and the 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 problem, of course, though, is that with, with a lot of this stuff, um, an argument can be made that innovators and entrepreneurs might be hesitant to start doing a lot of this work if they feel like they might get in trouble uh, or uh, they want to wait until there is a safe regulatory space. So uh, Amazon right, decided to test its delivery drones in England because they knew that the, the FAA had not uh, cleared the, the drones uh, delivery drone testing here. So uh, I can understand why Amazon didn't say, yeah, well, screw it, we'll do it anyway. You know, people want to be, I think if you want to be a respected private business, you don't want to get in trouble with uh, the feds. Uh, I get that. But I think that's an unfortunate feature of FAA regulation, that the FAA should have an approach of uh, you can, you know, uh, you will better be careful because you will uh, be in a position to ask forgiveness. But I still think that's a better position than uh, people in the drone space asking for permission. But I mean, in going kind of back to the question I asked before, with emerging technology and with the, to quote Donald Rumsfeld, the unknown unknowns in, you know, at play here, um, do we want people to be, I guess, extra special careful? in a lot of these areas because you, you can have situations where so the the story often is told a lot of people like you know this is this is the narrative is that all of a sudden a handful of people in palo alto while no one was watching broke american democracy with social media right or or a situation where you know that everyone's kind of out there innovating and then suddenly we have a rogue ai um and we can't do much about it or or you know like gene splicing CRISPR, people making stuff in their in their garages, and then we have a pandemic. Like that, that 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 kind of threat of regulation um, or that asking for permission does that help at least to mitigate against those kind of sudden catastrophes? Well, I think you're highlighting something interesting, uh, namely that. Well, 
first I'll say hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? That it's easy to look back and be like, wow, if we had X regulation, Y would never have happened. But it's easy for people to come up with scenarios. Uh, the difficult job is thinking of regulation that would hamper that scenario from ever taking place while also not hurting innovation. So uh, rampant AI, okay, so this is something anyone who's watched a science fiction film worries about. But what's the fix to that? Do we, we, we write a law saying no one shall build AI that will run amok on servers and take over? The, I mean, it's uh, isolating a threat is, is not the same thing as coming up with a good regulation for that threat. Uh, and so social media, uh, Social media companies ruined American democracy. So this is uh, sometimes said by people. But what what's the regulatory fix that would have stopped a lot of the uh, the bots and the trolls that uh, got everyone concerned in the wake of uh, the election? Uh, that that's a much harder question. It seems to me it's easy to get outraged and to get worried about possible threats, but coming up with solutions is much much harder. And I don't. I think we should also keep in mind how likely the threat is. Uh, it would be a shame if developments in AI were seriously hampered because a couple of lawmakers watched too many science fiction films and got really, really worried about uh, the you know, the Terminator scenario. <laughs> well, how big of a problem is, is that? Specifically that this is an area where lawmakers, I mean, we at the Cato Institute, we often lament how little lawmakers seem to know about the mm -hmm. subjects they plan to regulate and in fact, we have named our auditorium the F.A. Hayek Auditorium who, you know, Hayek famously offered a theory for why it was lawmakers could never know enough about the stuff they wanted to regulate right. to regulate it well. Um, but this seems to be an area where lawmakers are particularly ignorant that it's, I mean, it's, it's often cringe inducing to watch like congressional testimony because these lawmakers have levels of understanding of the internet of networks of technology that is substantially worse than you know the typical middle schoolers um so is that how do we deal with that kind of problem that we've got we've got a situation where lawmakers there's this tech they you know the the urge is always to pass a law um, whenever there's a threat or potential threat, it's pass a law, and they they're doing that because they want to do it. They're also doing it because constituents, you know, demand pass a law. But that this is an area where almost like by definition, you can't know much about it. Yes, I defy anyone under the age of thirty to watch anything like Zuckerberg's testimony <laughs> uh, on the Hill and not have their head in their palms by the end of it. It is very worrying that. Uh, Many of the lawmakers on the Hill don't seem to know much about this. And that makes sense because a lot of the people who'd be qualified to be on staff uh, in these offices to actually give advice and to explain to members of Congress how this stuff works could be paid much, much, much better almost doing anything else actually in the tech industry. And that's, that's a serious worry. And there's also this worrying inclination among some lawmakers to urge uh, technology companies to, and I quote, this isn't a phrase original to me, but to nerd harder, right? That whenever there's a problem like end-to-end -end encryption, people think, well, we don't like the fact that some terrorists can communicate using WhatsApp or Signal, but there must be a fix. You must, you know, how can you not fix this? And there's a there's a frustration there. Uh, where we're sitting, I, I think that we should maybe spend more time focusing on the benefits of this technology, not focusing on potential costs. So driverless cars will kill some people. They just will. Uh, and that's, of course, regrettable, but we should think about the lives that they could save. The vast majority of auto fatalities in the United States are directly attributable to human error. So from that perspective, uh, driverless cars that are, are better than human drivers but not perfect uh, will save thousands and thousands of lives a year. and. Once uh, Congress eventually gets happy with the proliferation of driverless cars, we should expect that for the next couple of years, there will be headlines of driverless cars killing people. And that's to be expected. And it will be a big cultural shift. Uh, so emphasizing the benefits rather than the costs, I think, uh, is is worthwhile. Uh, but of course, that's easy for me to say because 
I won't be the one sponsoring the bill that allows these things to run rampant. And then um, who are they going to wag the finger at when the bad things do happen? But uh, like I, I alluded to earlier, uh, good news rarely makes headlines. Uh, and it's also slow moving, right? It will take a long time for the benefits of driverless cars to be realized in the data. Uh, but the accidents and the deaths will be reported instantly. So what I hear from you, Matthew, is a sense that our cost accounting, our cost benefit accounting analysis is flawed, right? It's easy for us. It's kind of a seen versus the unseen situation. It's easier for us to imagine uh, apocalyptic worst case scenarios and then to discount the possible benefits. So whether it's, you know, pharmaceutical regulation, you know, something like the FDA has a, has a notoriously stringent safety requirement that doesn't really account for the fact that not approving a life-saving drug, drug costs thousands, even millions of lives. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't play a role. They just are asking whether or not the drug itself will harm lives. So uh, in that sense, we have a, you know, the, the ledger, the kind of accounting ledger is is flawed when it comes to emerging technology. But I'm also interested in hearing you talk about um, ways in which regula regulators themselves by regulating too quickly can actually fulfill a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy when it comes to kind of the downsides of that technology. So a good example of that would be what? I just want to make sure I understand the question. So uh, I suppose you can imagine a situation, right, where the FAA says, well, we haven't had as many drone accidents as other countries because we haven't let drones fly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Which probably an accurate statement, but <laughs> right, uh, right, we, yeah. we, we need to uh, keep in mind that while that's true and the FAA is tasked with safety, right? They need to make sure things are safe. Uh, we need to also keep into account what we're losing. Uh, I think when you ground drones, you incur a cost, namely uh, you are not having as innovative and as exciting an economy as you could have. So yes, a, a federal safety agency can stand up and say, uh, bad things aren't happening because we're just not letting people experiment. Uh, but it's not a particularly useful thing to say, it seems to me. Uh, and it's uh, also not helpful because no one who's rational is denying that emerging technologies will come at a price. We're just saying that in the long run, the benefits outweigh the cost. Given that, and given that bad regulation or overburdensome regulation can not just slow down the pace of progress, but can cost lives, can certainly reduce wealth, economic growth, when is it appropriate, and we've seen this happen a fair amount in the emerging tech space, when is it appropriate or is it ever appropriate to intentionally circumvent regulations? <laughs> so we're at the part where Aaron asks me, When's it okay to break the law? Uh, yeah. So, huh. I would like to point out that I think there are a lot of people who do this by accident, right? So, uh, I don't know the number, but I imagine there are many people who got drones for Christmas or birthdays, right? And uh, flew them without adhering 100% to FAA regulations. Uh, I can say that with almost a certainty. The response from the FAA, I think, should not be to bring the hammer down. Now, when when is it acceptable? Uh, I mean, I'm thinking I don't know. of like I think, sorry, go ahead. The classic example being like Uber, which Uber has arguably changed the world in and frequently in a positive way. They granted they have their problems as a company, but a lot of that came with them basically ignoring local regulations. Okay, uh, in that case, I would argue that at least in some of the jurisdictions, Uber could have made the argument that, well, we looked at the uh, taxi regulations and we decided that we didn't fit the definition of taxi, so off we went. Uh, that's a much easier argument, it seems to me than a drone operator uh, saying that they're not a uh, an aircraft under FAA definitions. Uber, I think, was doing something very interesting, which was providing uh, an obvious 
providing obvious competition to an incumbent in industry without being actually a very different thing. Uh, to, to customers behind the scenes, I think a lot of people found Uber and taxis to be uh, very similar, but actually they're very different kind of businesses and it's a very different kind of technology. Uh, I take your point and of course Uber's, Uber's opponents would oftentimes portray uh, portray Uber as a uh, as a lawless uh, invader. I think at least in some jurisdictions, Uber could make the argument that actually, no, we just feel like we didn't fit into that uh, regulatory definition. And Uber does fit into this very, or at least when it began, fit into a very awkward regulatory gray area. Uh, so in a situation where you've taken a look at existing regulations and you think that you don't actually uh, run afoul of any of them. I don't see why people shouldn't feel free to um, get into an area and innovate. Uh, Airbnb might be another example where you, okay, well, I took a look at local laws and I figured that I wasn't a hotel. Seems to be a reasonable thing for people to assume, but uh, I won't say this is without risk. You know, I wouldn't advise anyone in a private company to deliberately break the law and to um, hope that you have good lawyers on hand. I don't know if that's the the best approach because uh, local lawmakers don't like uh, don't like that kind of confrontation for sure. I mean, I suppose there's a some of that question comes down to one's own ethic, right? I mean, most people yeah, would imagine yeah. an, an ethical obligation to break the law when there is some kind of clear um, uh, cost to life um, that comes from following the law. I mean, yeah. so, you know, civil disobedience writ large. Mm -hmm. you know, no one, no one it, well, some people did hold him responsible. But when you know, Martin Luther King Jr. or another civil rights activist blocks the highway for a march on on, on Selma or Birmingham or, or whatnot, right? Like it, it, the idea is, is that laws are, it's okay to circumvent them when there's a clear ethical obligation um, to do so, that the law is less important than, than like ethical systems. But sure, that, yeah. that gets complicated really quickly depending on. I will mention here though that uh, Charles Murray, I think it's, I haven't read the book, but I think that in one of his most recent books, Charles Murray advocated for a law firm that specializes in protecting entrepreneurs like this mm -hmm. to basically encourage people to go out into the, the wilderness. Uh, Adam Thea uh, from Mercatus, who wrote an excellent book called Permissionless Innovation, he uh, categorizes technologies as born free and born captive, that some are born captive into regulatory regimes and others are born free. Uh, they're truly new and innovative and regulators haven't caught up yet. But if you're born free, as uh, Adam might call them, I think you better be ready for certain fights. Uh, and the Charles Murray's recommendation was, yeah, we should just basically have law, a law firm that specializes in helping entrepreneurs uh, with these kind of fights. Uh, from the regulator's point of view, I think they should perhaps just choose their fights more carefully uh, and and not scare away people, but uh, that's not going to happen anytime soon. And we, you know, the costs that we've been talking about, like uh, like deaths and injuries, are I think easier to discuss. But the problem with a lot of technology or emerging technology discussions are you have these more difficult to pin down complaints about the impact on society and what's it doing to our children and isn't this making them, us more isolated? Think about the citizenry. All, all that sort of stuff is... Uh, Thank you, Tipper Gore. It's well, <laughs> right. And it's, it's, it's interesting because it, this isn't a new kind of complaint, right? Uh, but nonetheless, uh, remains sticky. Uh, I wanted to, to briefly... Uh, read out a, a, a quote I found from 1992. There was uh, a Neil Postman, uh, sorry, wrote a book called um, Technopoly, The Surrender of Culture to Technology. And he was on C-SPAN in 1992 and he'd previously complained about uh, television, right? And he was, he was on and he said, uh, when I started to think about that issue, television, I realized that you don't get an accurate handle on what we Americans were all about by focusing on one medium, that you had to see television as 
part of a kind of a system of techniques and technologies that are giving the shape to our culture. For instance, if one wants to think about what has happened to public life in America, one has to think, of course, first about television, but also about CDs, and also about faxes and telephones and all the machinery that takes people out of public arenas and puts them fixed in their homes, so that we have a kind of privatization of American life. Uh, this is a really interesting kind of complaint, but he goes on to describe a future that we're kind of in now, where he says. One hears people say with some considerable enthusiasm that in the future, putting television, computers, and the telephone together, people will be able to shop at home, vote at home, express political preferences in many ways at home, so that they never have to go out in the street at all, and never have to meet their fellow citizens in any context, because we've had this ensemble of technologies that keep us private away from citizens. And I hear complaints like this quite regularly. I mean, that's from 1992, but there is still this very persistent. Uh, worry that emerging tech will make us in, uh, make us bad citizens, make us isolated. Uh, AI is exciting, but what what do you will will our children say please and thank you to the robots? Will the robots become our friends or um, our sex partners? You know, this is isn't all this stuff making us kind of isolated? And uh, this isn't a new concern. Uh, frustrating, and it's not going away. So we have been talking largely about. Policy making, policy makers, regulators, people who are in the in the the policy world. Mm -hmm. But how much of that is really just downstream of culture, mm -hmm. such that when we're talking, when we're we're dealing with these issues of emerging technology, that where the real action is happening is in the culture, is in the cultural acceptance of it, and so to to some extent, focusing on the on strictly the policy is kind of missing where much of the influence is or will be. I certainly do think that it's important to communicate to the public about this because uh, like you mentioned, some of these policy concerns are downstream from what uh, from the public. And uh, in preparation for the podcast, I was finding articles from you know 1859 editorials in the New York Times complaining about the Telegraph and uh, a 1913 New York Times article complaining about uh, the telephone and how it's incur bad manners. All this stuff uh, isn't new, but I think when we're we're sitting in a think tank, we should be ready to communicate with the public in addition to regulators and lawmakers. If if we have a optimistic, uh, forward-thinking public, then you hope that that will translate somehow and translate somehow to uh, lawmakers. But you know, lawmakers are made up of of human beings, and uh, the public are human beings, and they have a, a pessimism bias. Uh, and I think, though, when you focus again on on benefits that uh, maybe more parents would be happy if driverless cars could take their kids uh, to baseball practice, and it would be better for people if their elderly parents have. Uh, appliances in homes that can monitor if they've fallen down or if they have had a medical emergency. Uh, it would be good if we uh, were able to travel more safely, to have our homes know more about us. It would be you know nice to to come home and to have the home you know set at the right temperature and playing the right kind of music. Uh, making sure that people realize the benefits of a lot of this stuff is is I certainly think part of part of the mission. Uh, I, my only audience is not lawmakers, that's for sure. All of that, the home that knows a lot about you, the, all these things that can predict stuff about you, keep track of things about you, there's a lot of data there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of data gathering. A lot of it depends on devices that can surveil us mm -hmm. in, in one way or another. And we as libertarians, we as Cato Institute scholars, we spend a lot of time talking about the problems of government having access mm -hmm. to data and government surveillance programs. But are we concerned? Should we be concerned about the level of pervasive private surveillance that that rosy future you just sketched out demands? I think we should be worried. You can uh, listen and read a lot of Cato material on the concerns that we have about government access to data. And I certainly don't want to sound blasé about that. Uh, so I'm 
my primary worry is the government, mostly because as creepy as a lot of this might be when it comes to Amazon and Google, uh, Amazon and Google can't arrest me or put me in a cage, right? I think that is uh, a big difference. People might be a little creeped out by these shopping algorithms. Uh, they might be a little freaked out by the fact that these companies do know a lot about us. But I want the heavy lifting there to be on government access to that data. Uh, you you buy a lot of these appliances. There's a certain degree of you you assume that uh, they will be collecting information about you. But I'm not as worried about Amazon as I am the government for the reasons I just outlined. And I don't think Amazon has an interest in creeping out its customers too much. Should we be worried though about companies like Amazon gathering all this data, centralizing all this data, and then that data suddenly becoming either through the passage of legislation or through subpoenas or warrants or through government hacking accessible to the government? Yeah, there's a degree of trust you have in these uh, big companies. They they need to do a good job at at being custodians of data. Uh, I don't want to speak to the. I don't know a lot about uh, Amazon's actual security. Just using them as an example, uh, they have a very strong profit-seeking incentive to make sure that their customers' privacy is is not violated. There's not much though that they can do, right? When the government comes to them with a valid court order, they they you know uh, are put in a tough spot there. Uh, and and again, that's why I think that's where we should um, have the focus. But we we shouldn't be of in any doubt that a lot of these companies have a huge amount of information uh, on us. And I think it was my colleague Julian who once said that you know if if Google was a state, it would be uh, a pretty powerful police state, given the amount of information it has. Uh, my apologies to Julian if I'm butchering your quote, but the the point being that we they they do gather a huge amount of information on us, and uh, people even like me, right, uh, do incur a cost when you use Proton Mail instead of Gmail, or you use uh, DuckDuckGo instead of Google for web searches, uh, and that cost is that you know. Google now knows a little less about you and can't provide you with the degree of service that uh, most people have. But uh, that's fine by me. There's still choice. Google's not a monopoly when it comes to this sort of stuff. So, uh, And people value their privacy subjectively. Uh, and maybe I value it as slightly higher than the average person. But uh, I have no problem with people using Google products to make their lives better. Uh, I do worry about government access to that data to, uh, to conduct investigation. Uh, it, it feels like forever ago now, but it's only a few years ago, folks, where um, there was buzz about Ma Mark Zuckerberg running for president. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, that blend of uh, a major, you know, a major tech company mm -hmm. with the power of the state, while it's, you know, unlikely now. Um, it's not outside the realm of possibility, even if it's not as literal as the head of one being the head of the other. Um, something to go back to to uh, something you mentioned before, Matthew, you teased a bit about uh, how in Great Britain, uh, I think it was regulatory policy towards unmanned aerial vehicles was more favorable. So it pushed, you know, Amazon to conduct uh, tests overseas. So to broaden that out, how would you say like on the net, international uh, regulatory, the international regulatory landscape, how it compares to the United States? Like where is the US rank when it comes to relative freedom and regulation of emerging technology? I think it's difficult to say for the following reason that uh, saying technology policy is a bit like saying economic policy, right? right. It's, a, it's a huge range of, of things. Uh, so let's think of the plus side first. So the United States is still a global leader when it comes to tech innovation. Uh, this country is home to some of the best known, largest, and most interesting tech companies. Uh, global Data uh, recently produced a list of the most, the 25 most valuable tech companies in the world. 15 are in North America, seven in the Asia Pacific, only three are in Europe. Uh, and that I think is not an accident. Uh, Europe is, uh, as you alluded, is slightly, I would say, ahead of the United States when it comes to drone policy. But you know, they slapped Google with a, a huge, I think it was $5 billion fine on antitrust. There's 
Uh, so it depends on the technology you're talking about. They're certainly ahead when it comes to, I would say, drone policy. But uh, when you're leveling billion fines worth billions of dollars on Google, right? It's not a great look. And uh, so examine the policy, the the technology specific policy. I, I wouldn't want to go to a, a big generalization. I would say though that. There's probably a reason that the United States is still today a, a massive uh, hub and funder innovator when it comes to technology. Does competition work in that area? So do, do you see, is there evidence that countries look over at other countries that have better tech policy and so are getting better, bigger country companies, more innovative products mm -hmm. um, and say, well, I it's probably good for me to loosen things up a bit too? I don't know. I'd have to look at data. I think the problem is for a lot of these countries is, is that a lot of the uh, Silicon Valley is still a massive talent suck uh, for a lot of these a lot of these countries. Uh, that's that's a gut assumption. I'd have to look at data on that. Uh, competition, of course, is is an interesting point when you're talking about big companies like Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook because a lot of those companies are big enough that they can buy interesting smaller companies. So uh, what would be a good example? YouTube, Instagram, WhatsApp, these are all companies that were bought by uh, by much bigger companies. And that's not necessarily a bad thing uh, and it's not necessarily something that we should complain about. But for the foreseeable future, I imagine that Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple are going to be on the lookout for interesting new companies to buy. Uh, one, because they view them as competition down the road, but two, they also feel that they can do interesting things with those companies. And uh, that's, not a, that's not a bad thing necessarily. If you are building something that competes with Amazon and you're presented with a life-changing amount of money, there will be some people who say, no thanks, I'll keep plugging away at what I'm doing. I believe it's the case. I'm not a historian when it comes to Facebook, but I believe Facebook faced a, a buyout option at a certain point, right? Didn't someone want to buy Facebook? Well, they could right. be making that yeah. up. Yeah. But my point is that there are very large successful companies today that uh, said no to to buy out well, uh, Netflix is a famous yeah example. that might be yeah, a, Blockbuster yeah. had the offer on the table for mm -hmm. you know some minuscule fraction of what Netflix is valued at right and keep in mind that this this competition question is something we're going to hear more of as long as Trump is the president because there's a perceived uh, anti-conservative bias in Silicon Valley that people think is uh, actually affecting the product so. Uh, I think it's fair to perceive that most people who work in these big tech companies are probably to the left of the average American. I think that's fair to say that I'm not convinced that that personal bias among employees has had a direct impact on the products. And you've had, you're in this weird situation where self-professed conservatives right, are, <laughs> are now saying, well, they're too big and uh, we should talk about antitrust. When we're thinking about the big four, uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple, I, I'm not convinced that these companies are monopolies in the true sense. And uh, I think it would be a mistake to uh, bring antitrust uh, action against them. Uh, so the example that comes to my mind of international comp like kind of regulatory competition um, from uh, TechCrunch Disrupt out in San Francisco, uh, a, a number of panels hit on the idea that when full self-driving cars, level five, you know, no steering wheel, when that gets rolled out, it'll be rolled out in China before it gets rolled out in the rest of the world. And um, that will be because, according to a, a number of speakers, the central government in China has just established by fiat, we are going to be open to autonomous vehicle technology. And actually by uh, like the dollar value of investment in China just over the past year has matched in AV technology has matched the rest of the world combined. So you're seeing kind of that they're shifting to a place because in China, the central party can cut through local and state level competition. What that brings to mind for me though is a question for you, Matthew, about how emerging tech should be regulated by local and state authorities versus federal authorities. Like the question of federalism and emerging tech policy, 
how do you approach that as someone analyzing emerging tech? I'm very interested in a lot of the local regulations that handle industries like ride sharing and other things you see in the the sharing economy. But when it comes to a lot of the technologies we've discussed, that are very powerful federal regulators, um, the FAA, uh, the FCC, with uh, bioengineering and all that, the FDA. Uh, so I am in a position where I am mostly focused on uh, federal regulations, but I'm certainly uh, keeping an eye on what's happening at the local level. And as we discussed earlier, uh, state and local governments can take it upon themselves to address some of the concerns we've discussed, when it, especially when it comes to uh, drone surveillance was an example I used. And there are state and local governments that have been comparatively welcoming to the sharing economy, that they have uh, decided, no, we're going to be uh, a home of innovation and entrepreneurship, and that's what we want. But I think it's fair to say that for some of the big issues we've been discussing today, uh, driverless cars and drones and things like this, ultimately it's probably going to have to take some federal leadership to get the kind of regulatory playing field we want implemented. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.